please be seated. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for, for being here. I know your presence here is a source of strength and encouragement for the family. I know that they appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Let's begin together with a word of prayer together. Father, we come together acknowledging that you are God, that you are on your throne, and you've created all that is. You sustain us, you give us life and breath. Father, and beyond that, you give us hope. And Lord, we just thank you for Ernie. Thank you for his life. Thank you for the investment that he made in each of our lives, the way he impacted us. Lord, I ask your blessing on this time together that you would give us the comfort of your spirit, strength. And Lord, as we remember Ernie's life, Father, fill us with joy. Fill us with uh, a, a sense of celebration that he is now in your very presence. Lord, we thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Ernest W. Ernie, as we knew him. He was 80 years old when he went to be with the Lord, his Savior, on December the 13th. Long after a battle with COPD and heart failure, he was born in Barstow, Texas, just down the road from Odessa, where I was raised pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> he was born to Robert Lamar and Ida Bell Frisk McNally on August the 21st, 1941. Moved here to Amarillo to pursue his career in retail furniture and appliance sales, which where he was successful for many years. It was there that he met his wife and started their family. He then moved into the wholesale supply of furniture and appliances for the second half of his career. Ernie was a member of Paramount Baptist Church and a had a special passion for the men's Thursday morning Bible study. He was the co-founder of what became known as the Candy Lane or Candy Cane Lane each Christmas season. He thoroughly loved seeing cars come by to enjoy the lights, particularly the children. He was an avid dog lover and spent his life with one by his side. He loved sports, watching the Cowboys, the Golden State Warriors, and Tiger Woods. He survived by his wife of 59 years, Glenda Sue McAnally of Amarillo. Sons Ernie Lamar McAnally of and his wife, Sheila, of South Lake, Texas. Harvey Lance McNally of Amarillo. Granddaughter, Corey McNally. Grandson, Connor McNally. And wife, Molly. Grandson, Carson McNally. Granddaughter, Casey McNally. And great-granddaughter, Vera McNally. Ernie also looked forward to the, welcome, to the welcoming of granddaughter, Scout Riley McNally. Coming soon. Ernie is also survived by a sister, Bobby Hopper of Keller, Texas, brother Jim McNally of Dallas, two sisters-in-laws, Charlotte McNally of Azel, and Karen Stanley and her husband, Rock of Athens, Texas, and several nieces and nephews. He's preceded in death by his mother and father, also sisters, Naomi Schultz and Betty Baker, and brother Alan, or Bud McNally. Now Ernie's going to come share some of his favorite memories. And he promised to make us laugh. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I can't tell you what an honor it is to us as the family to have you guys here and present with us today. Um, I'm going to tell you some stories about dad that came to mind. Some of these I just learned about in the last couple of days. Some of them I've known for years. But I hope it gives you a little bit of insight as to who he was and what he was about. What most people don't understand, dad was actually a farmer. Everybody thinks he was in furniture and appliance sales and this type of stuff, and that's true. But he told me at a young age, you never know what seeds you're planting. I didn't think much of it at the time, but as I thought back over these last couple of days and I think about uh, the stories and it, I began to figure out he really was a farmer his whole life. Um, <laughs> I learned some things early. I saw this on social media. I'm not taking credit for this, um, but this week I learned from Sam Elliott who had a picture and says, when I was a kid, I learned there was two ways to die, natural causes and talking back to my daddy. And that was pretty much true with mine. <laughs> uh, he used to share some pearls of wisdom with me like, son, God gave you two ears and a mouth for a reason. Try to shut up and listen. And I heard that my entire life. Um, and I thank God that I did. Um, he always used to say, uh, I don't know about you and Harv. I buy you books. I send you to school. And I'm pretty sure you're eating the books. Um, that was Tough love from a father who loved his children, who was trying to craft and mold them 
to be the adults that he wanted them to be. And he did fantastic at that. Uh, I'm going to quote a line, give credit to Dan Fogelberg. All my life I've heard the song Leader of the Band. If you don't know it, I would encourage you to go listen to it. But there's a line that always hit me right here. He earned his love through discipline, a thundering velvet hand. Perfect description of my dad. His gentle means of sculpting souls took me years to understand. And we all probably have that to some degree with our parents. And we don't always understand what they do or why they do it. But there's a purpose. He said, you never know what seeds you're planting all the time. One time we learned together with Uncle Bud who preceded him in death and Aunt Shack who can't be here today. We had a family vacation and we went on a fishing trip up in the Durango, Colorado area. And that was the time when we learned without question that the smartest, sharpest, most intelligent fish that God ever put on this planet is a trout because we couldn't catch them. And the ways of West Texas of throwing a bobber out there with a worm on it sure didn't work. Well, the long story short, this vacation that we finally got to take and we were out there fishing, I think we fished four or five days straight in a row, and I mean, we caught absolutely nothing. And Harv and I were frustrated because we, we thought we were the great fishermen and this was going to be a very productive trip, and it just wasn't happening. And he came in the night... The, the last day we were there, he came in the night before and he says, guys, not to worry, we're going to catch fish tomorrow. We've talked to some locals. We learned what we're doing wrong. We know how to fix it. And tomorrow we're going to catch fish. So with that, Harvey and I got excited and we went to fish tomorrow. And they pull in this funny little place and it had this little pond in it. And he wasn't wrong. I mean, we threw the fish line out there and we were catching fish right and left. We caught two trout over four pounds, which is huge for a trout. And I couldn't believe it. It was the greatest time fishing I've ever had in my life. And it wasn't until we were getting ready to leave when they walked up and handed my dad the bill that I learned we were actually fix fishing in a trout farm. <laughs> and that was about a dad who didn't want to see his sons disappointed because they had come to Colorado to catch trout. By golly, they were going to catch some trout. That was about him caring. And as we left and we were coming back to Amarillo, a, a moment hit me and I was scared to death. Somewhere along the road as we stopped in Tres, uh, I think it was in Red River, I bought this stupid, ugly cap that I thought was the coolest thing ever. It was solid red with polka dots all over it. it was, thinking back on it, it was god awful. I don't know why I <laughs> picked that hat, but at the time I thought it was cool. And I wore that hat through the vacation. And on the way back to Amarillo, when the vacation was over, we had stopped somewhere to eat. We got on the road and we continued to travel. And it hit me, I had left that hat in the cafe. And I meekly, because I was very worried to bring this up, I said, I left my hat. You gotta remember, back then there weren't cell phones. You didn't call back to say, hey, did we leave a hat there and did you find it? None of that happened because we were out on the road well, mom says, don't worry, when we get home, I'll call back and have them mail it to us if they found it. Okay, what's the name of the cafe? Nobody knew. Well, we weren't sure exactly where we were at. We were hungry. We saw a cafe. We stopped. And about that time, with a stern look on his face, and I knew he was not happy, Dad pulled off the road, and he hit an exit, and he did a U-turn. We went back 40 miles to get that stupid cap. And the, and the air in the car was deadly silent. And he said, EJ, this is going to cost you big. And I'm sitting back there just fearing the worst. He says, this is going to cost you 20 licks with wet spaghetti. <laughs> and I laughed. And I, you know, I think back. And again, what that represented was love for his family. He wanted us to succeed. He wanted us to do things and yeah he was stern but he was a fantastic leader and loved his family uh, none of us ever questioned that there was no uh, question about that you never know the seeds that you plant 
Dad loved his profession that he got into in furniture and appliances. And I've heard three stories. I've learned all of these three stories in the last few days, and I didn't know any of these. So that's what makes it particularly important that I want to share these. A very good and trusted friend, Richard Kirkland, sitting here today, and he shared a story with me the other day that I was unfamiliar with. When Richard started and others that he worked with, to help them learn to sell, to take care of clients, to take care of customers, to do the right thing. Dad would have meetings on Sunday afternoons and they were closed on Sunday, he didn't get paid for Sunday, but he would work with people to teach them how you work with clients, how you help clients, what you gotta do to make things better and he helped people forge careers. And I can tell you, Richard in particular has had a very successful career and I think back, what if he hadn't planted that seed? Yesterday on the drive back to Amarillo, I was here earlier in the week and had to go home to get suit and whatever coming back. Got a call from a former boss and he was telling me, and I thought the world of him as well, and he said, I absolutely loved your dad. And I thought that was strange because in my memory, they had only met one time and they, we all went and had lunch together and they very much liked each other, but he said, I loved your dad and I'll tell you why. When I moved to Dallas-Fort Worth and I was chartered with starting an office, he goes, I've never told you this, but I was in trouble from a career standpoint. I'd worked for a company named Lanier. They were very regimented, almost like a military type precision in what they did. And he said, and I got to Dallas, Texas, and the first guy I hired was you. And he said, you used to butt heads with me. And you'd say, that's not the right way to do it. And it would make me so mad but I learned to stop and listen to what you had and I found an authentic, an authentic attitude and a caring and a, and a wholesomeness. And I always wondered, how on earth does this guy have this ability to want to do these things until I met your dad and I knew exactly where it came from. And I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I didn't know that that ever even registered with him and he started describing things and I thought, you never know the seeds you plant. Uh, a friend of mine, Rod Scott, roommates with Rick and Manny and I go through college, went fraternity brothers together. Got an email last night that I read that he wrote to mom. I never even knew that he worked at Emerald Hardware, but apparently he worked at Hard Emerald Hardware right out of college, worked in a marketing department. And he said, every time I'd go to lunch or break, I would go over to the furniture division. And my boss didn't understand that. And he said, why do you keep going over to the furniture division? And I never knew this. He would go and sit and have coffee with my dad. And he, he said, I told my boss, because I'm learning from the greatest salesman I ever met. And he goes, and that hadn't changed. And Rodney is now in charge of a medical device for one half of the country that helps people with diabetes. You never know the seeds that you're going to plant and what comes from that. Candy Cane Lane, as you mentioned, is a particular pride for him. Uh, I'm gonna tell you real quickly how that story started. When Corey was just a baby and the first time, her first Christmas, we went, came to Amarillo for Christmas to be with mom and dad and have Christmas together. And Corey said, where are the Christmas lights? And once we left, dad and his next door neighbor, Dan Reed, started communicating and they said, you know what, same thing happened to me. We're gonna vow that next year, when our ki kids come for Christmas, there's gonna be Christmas lights. And they started putting them up and they started building candy canes and it spread. And pretty soon the entire block had the candy canes outlining. Well, go by there tonight if you have a chance. Drive down the street see the lights that we all grew up there those lights used to, there were some lights but not like there is today there's a lot of lights and there's a lot of candy canes and they go all the way from Coulter to bell now i can tell you my dad doesn't know all those people but he worked to plant those seeds and you never know when you plant a seed and it falls on fertile soil what's going to come of it christmas was very special to my dad and I did laugh the other day because mom and I were 
uh, we were actually working on the obituary and I just died laughing. And she looked at me in the somber moment and she said, what is so funny? I said, I just realized dad died in December. So he's probably hitting the pearly gates right now. He's talked to St. Peter and he's met Jesus. And Dan is sitting over there on the side going, come on, we only got two weeks to get all these lights up. <laughs> Which is exactly what they would have been doing if they were here on earth. And uh, to think of that is incredible. But I want to share one other small story. The first year, I think Sheila and I were married. And we were coming home for Christmas. We were coming to Amarillo. And, you know, it drives my wife crazy because when I drive, I'm always looking at everything. Uh, she says it's ADD. I don't know. I can't, I can't confirm or deny that. But the point was we were leaving. We were coming up 287, and I noticed this hitchhiker. And I just looked at him, and I kept going. And I got about 120 miles down the road, and the same hitchhiker was on the side of the road. And I kept going. And as I was coming out of Clarendon, that same hitchhiker was on the side of the road. And I don't know why. It was an inspiration from God or whatever. Um, I've never pick, picked up a hitchhiker in my life. And I stopped and told Sheila, we're picking that guy up. And she was mortified. <laughs> You're doing what? <laughs> and I said, he's, he's making as good a time as we are, so he's obviously doing something right you know, uh, but he's doing something with a purpose, and we stopped, and we picked up this guy, and his name was Jimmy, that's all I can tell you, and he rode with us into Amarillo, and at his request, we dropped him off at the bus station downtown, and I left, and what I learned in that story was, he didn't have the means, but he was trying to get home to see his mama for Christmas, and he was headed to Colorado, and that's why he was coming up 287. As soon as we got to mom and dad's house, and you know, when you're young, you come to Christmas when you can, and it's after work, like what you guys dealt with yesterday. So it was late at night when we got there, and I explained to them, I picked up a hitchhiker, and they said, you did what? And I told them the story. And dad said, give me just a minute. And he got his clothes on, he said, come on, come with me. So where are we going? He goes, we're going to the bus station. And he went to the bus station, and we found Jimmy. And he said, where are you trying to go? And he said, Colorado. And he said, it's awfully cold to be hitchhiking this type of year. Dad went over and asked the guy, I need a bus ticket to wherever it was in Colorado. And he bought him a bus ticket. And he walked over and he gave it to him. And he said, Merry Christmas. That's my dad. Did he do a lot of things wrong? Absolutely. Just like all of us. But he did a lot of things right. And he planted a lot of seeds. And Harvey reminded me yesterday that uh, one of his favorite verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 13, ironically, and now these remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And Dad tried to give love through his whole life, and I think he was really successful at it. You never know what seeds you plant. So in my dad's honor, what I'd like to do is share two things that I swear if he were here right now today, he would tell you. If you smoke, stop smoking. He would ask you to. He was never preachy about it. He smoked like crazy for years. A lot of smoking. Those of you that know him know what I'm talking about. But toward the end of his life, as he's walking around on oxygen 24-7, in his lack of mobility and his lack of being able to do things, he would tell everybody he saw, don't do like I did. Be smarter. Find a way to get away from that. Whenever you do, you're better off. The other thing he would tell you is that his most important thing was his relationship with Jesus Christ. They always say that you're going to come to Jesus and you're going to meet Jesus through one of two ways. Invitation or situation. Don't let it be your situation when you come to meet him. Accept him in. Take the salvation that he offers and understand at this Christmas time that the greatest gift ever given was the gift of Jesus Christ. 
when Dad started Candy Cane Lane, one of the things I'm proud of is he decorated. He and Dan both put these big signs. Go by there. You'll see it tonight. He printed out there bright. It says, Jesus is the reason for the season. And he believed that with all his heart. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In honor of him, if there's anything I can leave with you today, those are the two things that I think he would share. I thank you for your time and listening, and I'm going to leave one other quote with you before I be quiet. This is from F. Scott Fitzgerald. He was an American novelist of mid-19th century, but he acclaimed... Uh, achieved a certain level of acclaim and fame. And he said, for what it's worth, it's never too late to be whoever you want to be. I hope you live a life that you're proud of. And if you find that you're not, I hope you have the strength to start over. There was times, many times in life, Dad had to start over. I think there's many times in life the rest of us have to start over too. But think about that this Christmas season. Love your family, love your loved ones, be around them and hold them close. Tell them how much they mean to you. He always did. Thank you. Ernie grew up in Barstow. He was the sixth of six. He was, the, he was the baby. He was only two pounds when he was born. That's tiny. 
In fact, the doctor said he didn't think that he would survive. They found a shoebox and put him in that shoebox and put him in a dresser drawer next to a potbelly stove, and that was his incubator. And he survived. Not only did he survive, but he thrived. He did well with the life that God gave him. He made his public profession of faith in Jesus as his Lord and Savior in 1962, the year uh, E.J. and I were born. Serving the Lord and his family became his major focus. He taught Sunday school and was youth director at Summit Baptist Church. He served on several committees and loved his Thursday morning Bible study group of men that met on Thursday mornings. He joined Paramount Baptist Church in 1978. He was a faithful member there all these years. He loved people. Like Ernie said, he wanted to see them succeed. He loved to invest in their lives. One of the things he also loved to do was cook. And I don't know if he enjoyed cooking because he loved to eat. I really think more of it was because he liked to give it away. He loved to bless others with the food that that he cooked. One of the stories they were telling me today or yesterday was that he went into, I guess it was at United, and he had some cookies, and he was passing those out. And a lady came up to the counter and said, I want to buy some of those cookies. And she said, "Uh, what cookies? And we don't sell those cookies. And he said, well, a man's been giving these out. And he said, well, he doesn't work here. <laughs> he, just, he just gives those cookies out. And she said, you need to hire him. <laughs> he loved uh, what happened at Candy Cane Lane. Not because it looked great, but it, it, it blessed others. Because he loved to see the, the smiles and the faces of people as they would walk by or drive by and, and just enjoy the beauty of all the lights. Um, and I think you said it was, it was, he, it was your dad that said, uh, in the daytime it doesn't look like much, but whoa, at night it comes to life. It looks great. And I think also he enjoyed... Christmas and the lights because it was the celebration of his Lord and Savior. He wanted people to be a part of that and to be exposed to celebrating Jesus' birth. One of Ernie's dear friends who probably met him at the pearly gates, Don Moore, inspired Ernie as he was watching him deal with Parkinson's. Someone would ask Don how he was doing, and Don would reply, shaking and stooped over with his Parkinson's, and he said, I'm a ball of raging fire. I remember Don saying that, and that inspired Ernie to live his life with that attitude, like Don. Drinking coffee was Ernie's way of getting close to people. I think he loved coffee, too, but that was kind of... and ends a means to an end. He, he loved to get close to people. If, he, if there was a decision to make or something to be discussed, it was over a cup of coffee. In fact, he used to get the boys up early before school, long before they really needed to be up so that they could sit around and drink coffee and, and talk about whatever was going on to get close to each other, and, and they did that. He loved to go to Henry D's almost every morning. And he would bring something to to pass out oftentimes, something to eat, something to share with people. Love, the love of God was so evident in Ernie. And as you mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could even move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Love is important. 
God said so. He goes on and he, he explains. And, you know, oftentimes this passage is, is used in weddings. And you think, well, why are we talking about that at a funeral? Well, honestly, this was written by Paul to a church that was struggling. And they were struggling because they were thinking they were better than each other. I've got this gift. Well, I've got this gift. And I'm better than... And he said, no. You need to get things right. And he goes... He goes through this, and he gives you a good understanding of what love really is. It says, love suffers long, it's kind, does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, does, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. We, we could study that every day. You could read that every day, and you're still going to have to work at it because it's hard to do all those things. It's hard to love that way. Paul was trying to teach, God was trying to teach these Christians how to behave how to live among each other with kindness, with forgiveness, with humility, bearing with one another, caring for one another. And that was Ernie. That was his life. He enjoyed sharing that love, sharing that kindness with others. It's hard for our finite minds to fathom eternity. To even start thinking about eternity just kind of, <laughs> makes our minds just like I can't can't grasp eternity I mean everything's got to end right but that's that's how we think of things because that's the way the earth is that's the way our mortal life is right now eternity is something that God has always been a part of and again, how, do, how, do, how is that possible? God had to start somewhere, right? He's always been. Can I explain that? No. Won't even try. But it's unique because of who he is. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he gives us a little bit of understanding of what happens to us when we die. And it says this. For we know that when this earthly tent that we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave our earthly bodies, we have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself. We will have this house not made by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on our heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. Ernie's got a new body. He got a lot of good miles out of his old body, but it was wore out. He was ready for a new body. And we don't know exactly what he's doing right now. He may be decorating a new candy lane in heaven. Not sure, but I'm sure he's celebrating. Celebrating the new life. Celebrating his Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan inside, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. And then he goes on in, in verse 7, he says that we live by believing, not by seeing. And he says we are fully confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. When we leave this earthly body, when we put our faith and trust in God, we'll be with him in his presence. And that's where Ernie is. Well, how do we do that? Just simply, Jesus himself says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John said that <coughs> concerning Jesus, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, how do you do that? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He says you will be saved. That's all it takes. 
Some people think, well, that's too easy. That's, there's got to be more to it. I've got to do something. Praise God, Jesus did all that is necessary. He took our place on the cross that we deserve, the death we deserve. He went to the grave. He went to hell itself. But he conquered it when we couldn't. All we have to do is put our faith and trust in him. What a wonderful, exceptional legacy y'all have in Ernie. He lived a life before you, not a perfect life, but a life of love, of compassion, a life committed to his Lord and Savior. He lived a legacy, or he leaves a legacy of faithfulness and service. Service to others, kindness, love for his family and his community. We'll miss him, but we'll see him again. And it won't be long. In fact, he'll probably turn around when we get to heaven and he'll go, wow, that was quick. <laughs> Time, I think... As the Bible says, in, in heaven will be no more. Don't have to wear my watch anymore. That's going to be cool. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of having known Ernie. And Father, I pray that you would help us to, to live our life in a way that would honor him. Most of all, honor you. And direct other people to you just as Ernie lived his life. Father, help us to be uh, people of love, compassion, and kindness, that others might be drawn to you. Lord, I continue to lift up this family, and I pray, Father, your blessing on them, that you would fill them with peace, with joy, remembering the things that Ernie invested in their lives but also hope father hope knowing that you have paid the price that we might have eternal life and not just a wishful hope but a confident hope believing that you are who you say you are you've done what you've said you'll do So, Lord, we just put our hope and our faith and our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.